All right, well, to keep us on schedule, we'll just go ahead and, and start. Um, so thank you for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Hurst Wender, and I have the honor to be Preservation Virginia's Director of Museum Operations and Education. I'll be moderating today's program of remarkable archaeologists, researchers, and historians as we discuss the history and the origins associated with some of the interesting objects that were found at Bacon's Castle. Um, mostly during our restoration work, both decades ago and as recent as just a year or two ago. And it's with um, new eyes that we're able to provide a better context for the lives of the individuals to whom these concealed things may have once belonged. So as, as folks are joining us, uh, one of the things that we really enjoy is uh, knowing where everybody's tuning in from today. Um, so if you look at uh, your screen, you'll probably see a chat box. And if you could uh, just type in the location of where you're tuning in from, we'd, we'd love to see. I'm looking at the attendee list already um, and I see a lot of familiar names. So welcome to everybody. Um, I know that there's also quite a lot of you from the National Park Service. Uh, so welcome. It's also an honor to have you in attendance. Thank you. Well, it's looking like there's people from all over. We have Texas and North Carolina, lots of different places in Virginia, um, Boston, Massachusetts, Florida. So, wow, wow. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, now, before we get any uh, deeper into the topic, I do want to share a little bit about the basic format of this webinar. And so what we're going to do is have each of our panelists provide a little presentation. Um, they're going to highlight their areas of expertise. And then after the presentations, we'll have a question and answer portion, and we'll be able to take questions from you in the audience. So you'll also notice that in addition to a chat box, there's a Q&A uh, box. So at any time during any of the presentations, you are welcome to type in questions into that box. Um, and when we get to that portion of the program, we're going to try to answer as many of them as we can. Now, it's, it's also worth mentioning that we're all presenting to you from our homes. And while we've tried to lock up the dogs and keep the cats and the children away from our screens, um, please excuse any unintended interruptions. Now, I try to typically keep to an hour time frame for these webinars, um, but I'll say that this is a truly fascinating topic and it may go a little long. So to be respectful of your time, we'll be sure to keep the presentations within this hour time frame. But in order to answer uh, many of the questions that I suspect that we'll have, we may go a little long. And it's totally understandable if you need to log off at 1 p.m. The webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on our website and our YouTube station in the near future. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background about Preservation Virginia. Um, for those of you, most of you are probably familiar with us, but if not, here's a little bit of information. So at 132 years, Preservation Virginia is the nation's oldest statewide historic preservation organization. We own and operate the John Marshall House, Scotchtown, Bacon's Castle, Smith's Fort, Cape Henry Lighthouse, and Historic Jamestown. And for our guests that are unable to visit our sites in person at the moment, we have over 40 digital programs and tours that are available on our website or YouTube channel. And so I encourage you to also uh, follow us on our social media pages, Facebook and Instagram, sign up for our e-news so you can find out about more programs like this one. Now our statewide uh, preservation initiatives um, have helped to save more than 400 places throughout the Commonwealth, including our Rosenwald School Architecture Survey, Tobacco Barn Preservation Project, and our work with the General Assembly and Congressional Advocacy has helped us um, as we advocate for a future for Shaco Bottom, Pine Grove School Community, and Rasawit, the historic capital of the Monacan Indian Nation. Most of our work stems from grassroots efforts with communities that know their history better than anyone else. And the majority of our statewide programs come through our Most Endangered Historic Places program. And so if you uh, have an endangered historic place that needs a uh, nomination, please visit our website and find out more details about how to nominate the place. Today, we'll be exploring Bacon's Castle um, as the basis for our discussion of ritual concealment and hidden objects. 
So Bacon's Castle is known as the oldest brick dwelling in North America, and it's a rare survivor. It's located in Surrey County, Virginia, and it's been witness to a great deal of change since it was constructed in 1665. It's seen the rise and fall of family dynasties, of wealth, of poverty, and the transition from indentured servitude to enslaved labor, followed by tenant farming and industrial agriculture. Bacon's Castle came into Preservation Virginia's stewardship almost 50 years ago, and since that time, we've been dedicated to preserving and researching this unique place. Research is forever ongoing and constantly yielding secrets. Um, and thanks to archaeologists and researchers like Rebecca Flanto, we are dedicated to continue to growing, to continuing to grow our understanding um, of the people and objects that are associated with this place in our past. Now we're more dedicated than ever before to discovering the stories of all of the people who are associated with Bacon's Castle. And that includes descendants of people once held in bondage, people associated with Bacon's rebellion, tenants, owners, and renters. And so if you out there have a connection to this place, please reach out. We want to hear your story. Now I'd like to quickly turn it over to Rebecca Planto. So Rebecca is a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology at William and Mary uh, with a concentration in historical archaeology. And she's been working with Bacon's Castle and our historic archaeological collection for several years now. So Rebecca, the floor is yours. All right, I have to press all the right buttons, sorry. Um, let's see. Sorry, I can't see all of my um, buttons now. I apologize. My computer updated and I don't know how to use anything on it anymore, apparently. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, so there's not as much, not too much background I need to give after Jennifer's introduction, I think, but um, the, the thing that led us to this presentation um, is, so my doctoral research, as Jennifer said, I've, I've been lucky enough to work with Preservation Virginia and with um, the James River Institute for Archaeology, um, Nick Lucchetti and everybody there um, who, who's done all, a lot of the archaeology at Bacon's Castle to work on, with the collection. And um, my research mostly focuses on the 17th century, the transition, uh, the changing landscape to transition from um, indentured servitude to slavery um, uh, in, and everything around that. But um, I came across these um, boxes in storage in the collection that we didn't realize were, were there in storage with everything else. And it turned out that they uh, included materials that had been pulled from the walls um, from Bacon's castle. And then as Jennifer said, um, we've also found uh, there were other things that had been found before and and since then in just the last couple of years in the in the quarter from um, and most of the artifacts from the 19th century um, but there's sort of a wide range of, of materials here and um, so today's program focuses on like a really small subset of these materials um, Specifically, the finds that have that appear to have some kind of intention behind them, as as far as concealments. So um, there is a again, it's it's a diverse assemblage. There are things that were probably from rats' nests. There are things that were that probably fell through the cracks when people were sweeping or um, using the hearth and things like that. Um, and that's all stuff archaeologically that I find really fascinating, but we're going to, we're the when we turn to um, our guest panelists, they're going to share sort of background context on um, things like which bottles, bottle charms, uh, concealed footwear, um, metal charms and objects, and I'm going to try to <laughs> try to keep my focus um, for the Bacon's Castle stuff today to those things and so what what we think like how how did I how did we come to determine that they were intentional um, and why we think it's significant and specifically why these things are significant not just as examples of a of a pattern that we know exists but really why they matter in the history of Bacon's Castle as as a site as a home um, as Jennifer said to generations of people um, who were 
uh, and, and as we'll see, I think with these artifacts, in some cases, enslaved or who were tenants or who were laborers. Um, and so it really offers a glimpse that we wouldn't otherwise have. So that that's really the goal of today's um, presentation. So um, I am. Uh, so Jessica, I'm mean, gonna we're gonna turn this over at first to our panel, our other panelists. So Jessica and Sarah's presentation will provide insight into footwear and metal finds, um, which are some of the most commonly concealed or uh, and or sort of ritual type artifacts that we see across the Eastern US and other places. And then Brenna will discuss bottle charms, witch bottles, um, et cetera, with an example that's pretty close to home at Walnut Valley Quarter, which is um, on Chipo now part of Chipotle State Park. So it's less than a mile from Bacon's Castle. And then I will come back and try to, you know, pull all of that together and, and uh, use that to, dis to discuss the finds from Bacon's Castle. Um, so I will now stop sharing my screen for now. And uh, turn it over to Jessica. All right, so we'll do a quick little bio for Jessica. Jessica Costello has worked in the archaeology program at the Northeast Museum Services Center, a regional office within the National Park Service since 2003. She works with archaeology and history collections from national parks across the northeastern United States. And before coming to NMSC, Jessica worked in the curatorial department at the Adams National Historical Park. She has a master's degree in historical archaeology from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where she researched concealed footwear for her master's thesis. Thank you, Jen. I am going to attempt to share my screen. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Jessica Costello and I work for the National Park Service at the Northeast Museum Services Center. Uh, the subject of ritual concealments is a huge fascinating topic that we could spend weeks talking about. So I will be talking specifically today about my research on concealed footwear, shoes and boots found within the fabric of structures in the United States. And for the purposes of time, I will be reading from a, from a script. So just excuse my, my looking down. My journey into the topic of concealed shoes began here, my childhood home. I grew up in a farmhouse in rural upstate New York. The house was built in the late 18th century with an addition put on in the mid 19th century. My mom was always working on the house as I was growing up and once found what she described as a child-sized buttoned boot between the walls. I was reminded of the little boot when I was working at the Adams National Historical Park in Quincy, Massachusetts in the early 2000s. I was in graduate school at the time for historical archeology span and was looking for a thesis topic. A report on the John Adams birthplace mentioned 44 shoes and boots found within the walls of the house during a rehabilitation project. So a few of them are shown here. The report mentioned the possibility of a shoemaker's ritual. The house was occupied by shoemakers in the early 19th century, but stated that the explanation behind the concealed items was largely unknown. And I was hooked. My favorite definition of concealed shoes comes from the Northampton Museum and Art Gallery, which states that concealed shoes are those that have been deliberately hidden in buildings and they have been a fascinating mystery for many years. The act of concealing shoes was not well documented and theories behind the meaning of the ritual are just that, theories. As much as, as much as I would love to find a diary with an entry that begins, today we stuck a few old shoes in the cavity behind the chimney. I have yet to see it. Some theories behind concealed shoes are that they were intended to deter witches and or evil spirits, to assure good fortune in trade or otherwise, to prevent bad luck and as a grieving gesture. Clues we can use to examine possible motives include the age of the shoes, the history of the buildings in which they were found, including periods of construction and reconstruction, the history of the occupants, and local events.
<clears throat> My research on concealed shoes began in earnest at the Northampton Museum and Art Gallery in Northampton, England. This is a picture of graduate student me arriving in Northampton about 20 years ago. I am happy to report that according to Google, the Super Sausage Cafeteria, whose picture is seen here, the sign is seen in the picture, is still open for business. Since the 1950s, the Northampton Museum has kept an index of concealed shoes reported worldwide. Now they have resources online, but at the time of my research, um, it consisted of a paper card catalog that I spent a day combing through. After visiting Northampton, I expanded my research on cases of concealed shoes in the United States by studying collections of concealed shoes at the Peabody Essex Museum and Historic New England, as well as contacting and visiting countless small historical societies and private homes where hospitable curators and homeowners were eager to share their finds with me. It was a scavenger hunt in the best possible way, and I may be the one person on earth who was disappointed to finish my graduate thesis. I created this map to give you an idea of where concealed shoes have been discovered in the United States. This is based on my hands-on research as well as online sleuthing. In a nutshell, they are everywhere. Concealed shoes in America have been found in big houses, small houses, fancy houses, modest dwellings, buildings occupied by white Americans as well as those occupied by African Americans, government buildings, military buildings, and factories. My work with national parks has led me to several examples at National Park Service sites, a couple of which I will share with you next. One big question surrounding concealed shoes is where in a building they are found. Discoveries near openings like chimneys, doorways, and windows support the hypothesis of a protective charm intended to deter witches and evil spirits from entering. This shoe sole was found under the hearth at the Hartwell Tavern at Minuteman National Historical Park. This lady's slipper was found near the sill of the front archway at Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters, National Historic Site. Now for some shoe statistics. The earliest American concealed shoes I've seen firsthand are 18th century, including this example on the left from the collection at Historic New England. The latest example I've seen firsthand is this one on the right from a private home in Melrose, Massachusetts, which dates, I believe, to as late as the 1950s. Most of the concealed shoes that I have examined date to the first half of the 19th century. Most concealed shoes are examples of utilitarian everyday wear, including slit vamps, latchet ties, bluchers, and brogans. They are not what you would see in fashion plates, but rather scenes like this portrayed in the 19th century painting, Talking It Over. Concealed shoes are often well-worn, lots of superstitions and folklore surrounding shoes, of which there are thousands, um, involve specifically old shoes. For example, the custom of throwing an old shoe at someone for good luck. I will end with a couple of examples. This lady's bathing slipper dating to the 1870s to 1880s was found in the officer's quarters building at the Augusta Arsenal, which is now Augusta State University in Augusta, Georgia. The building was constructed between 1827 and 1828, but needed significant repairs after the 1886 Charleston earthquake. Primary sources, including letters and newspaper reports, indicate extensive damage and trauma experienced by Augusta residents. Perhaps this shoe was concealed during repairs for extra assurance against future disaster. Folklore accounts and even an entry in the concealed shoe index refer to the practice of concealing a deceased child's shoe in a home as a grieving gesture. This small shoe was found concealed near the chimney of a home in Wayland, Massachusetts. The family occupying the home in the early 19th century lost six children before the age of two. 
Of course, we cannot say with any certainty, but such tragic circumstances suggest grief as a possible interpretation here. I was reminded of this case when reading that in the study of gravestone iconography, an empty shoe symbolizes the death of a child. Uh, that's it for my slides. Um, I hope I kept it to around eight minutes and I will stop sharing. All right, thank you, Jessica. Okay, so um, next we'll be hearing from um, Sarah Rivers Cofield. Uh, she has been the curator of federal collections at the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Laboratory at Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum since 2004. She holds a BA in history from Murray State University in Kentucky and a Master of Applied Anthropology from the University of Maryland. Sarah specializes in archaeological collections management, material cultural research with a focus on small finds and metal artifacts and promoting online collections access. She recently received a grant from the Conservation Fund to add new research on equestrian artifacts to the MAC Labs Diagnostic Artifacts in Maryland's website. All right, so Sarah, it's your turn. <laughs> Okay, am I sharing the right screen? No. Okay, are you all seeing my PowerPoint? Fabulous. <clears throat> all right, so now that we have heard about the shoe phenomenon, I'm gonna be sharing examples of metal artifacts that might make it into building concealments because of their perceived magical or protective properties. And the two main ones that I've researched are horseshoes and coins. So I'm gonna show some examples of those, but think about those horseshoes and coins as the best documented, best documented examples, which are sort of like a gateway so that when you find those, then you start looking at the other things around them to see what else might have some significance there that's associated with those artifacts. So the first example I'm gonna share from Maryland um, is from Maryland's Eastern Shore. It's called the Cloverfield Site. Um, and this is a house that's still standing. It was built around 1705. It's been undergoing some major renovation. They have a whole blog about it and everything. Um, and some of my colleagues at Applied Archaeology and History Associates were hired to do the archaeology there. And as they were doing some excavations in the cellar, at the bottom of the stairs, they found a pit that had two 19th century men's shoes, one heel up, the other heel down, and they were capped with a large river cobble. And you can see that in that top picture. Um, also within the same pit was a horseshoe. And those two shoes and the horseshoe were all oriented due north, even though that's not how the house was oriented. So they were oriented north instead of along with the house. So these shoes are not a pair. It's not as if somebody decided to store their old shoes here under a rock and no horse ever made it into the cellar of this house. So to me, this is very clearly a deliberate deposit made at some point when the cellar stairs were being redone in the 19th century. <clears throat> the second example I have of concealed horseshoes is in Prince George's County, Maryland at the Molly Berry site, which is a 19th to 20th century site that was either a slave quarter or overseer's house turned tenant house. Um, this is again, a standing structure where archeology span was conducted and seven horseshoes were found in and around this structure. And they clustered at doors, windows and a hearth that was later converted into a door. Um, and this highlights that long established use of horseshoes and iron in general to protect the openings of dwellings. That's from those evil spirits and witches like Jessica was talking about with the shoes. Um, Horseshoes and iron in general are considered to have protective properties and iron, especially if it's pointy or sharp, um, is considered to be protective. And there was also a hoe blade in front of the hearth here. And so there you have another, it's a sharp iron thing um, and it's an agricultural tool that is out of context in this sort of domestic house. So when you have these artifacts that are sort of agricultural in a domestic context, it, it gives you um, reason to believe that they're being used for their protective properties in the home. Uh, the third example I'm going to talk about is a site I've been working on a lot lately. It's the Smith St. Leonard site, which is our public archaeology site at the Mac Lab. 
It's one of the largest collections we have. It was occupied from 1711 to 1754, and it has a lot of equestrian artifacts that feed into this grant that I've been working on to add equestrian artifacts to our website. Um, the site is really rare because it has a stable, and in this time period, the beginning of the 18th century, people rarely sheltered their horses. Um, and there were a lot of equestrian artifacts in and around that stable, but you notice from this picture, you're seeing all these equestrian artifacts, but there's no horseshoes, none in the stable. Um, and that's normal for this time because in the tidewater, we have nice clay soils and it wasn't necessary to shoe your horses. That didn't really call for it here. But this site did yield one single horseshoe and it was found in the cellar fill in front of the kitchen hearth. Uh, the fill dates to a remodeling episode of the hearth and chimney. We believe that was taking place around 1750. Um, and we can assume, again, horses didn't live in this kitchen. So this is probably a protective or a lucky horseshoe um, that was guarding that hearth chimney area. And knowing that we have some protective magic in this cellar also has us taking a look at some other artifacts that are there um, that might have been guarding the fireplace. And one of those was a pierced silver coin that was found in the area on the other side of the hearth. And the coin is another one of those sort of key protective objects that we see recurring. Um, coin magic goes back thousands of years in the Western world, at least to ancient Greece, where people used to conceal coins and ships for good luck. Um, some of the more common uses of coin magic I've seen reference to are bending a coin as part of a vow to go on a pilgrimage in a time of crisis, bending a coin to give it as a gift of love or a betrothal or a good luck charm, um, employing silver coins to ward off witches. Uh, for example, if you had a, a hair or witch hair was a thing people thought witches disguise themselves as rabbits and you could only kill them by shooting them with a silver coin. Um, <clears throat> piercing a coin so you could wear it for sort of any protective reason. And then you could also use these coins to protect dairies and other perishables from witches and curses. And you could do that either by placing the coins at the corners of buildings or keeping a coin on hand to throw in the butter churn um, if the cream won't turn into butter and you believe a witch is causing that. So that last um, example is what I think is going on with another coin found at the Smith St. Leonard site. So we have the pierced coin guarding the hearth at the kitchen. And then there was another half silver coin, so an altar coin found in the very deep post of a cellar um, that we've interpreted as a storehouse. And it was at the entryway to the cellar in the deepest post under that post mold. So it's concealed there. And I suspect that maybe they were storing perishables here. And so that coin was probably put there to protect those perishables. Um, note that both of the coins are altered and they're silver and they're in these sort of opening vulnerable areas. Those are all keys to the context of coin magic. Um, and two other really great examples. Um, one from Maryland is the Clover, the Calverton site, sorry, um, which is not too far away from Smith St. Leonard in the same county where it's a 17th century site and a post hole at the door entrance way yielded a silver James the first shilling kind of shoved up against that post. Um, and then one of my favorite examples is from another preservation Virginia site, the Reverend Richard Buck site, where one of the burials had a silver sixpence folded into thirds and cut in half and probably placed in this man's hand. Um, and some other interesting things about this burial is he was a reverse burial, meaning in Christian tradition, when the second coming of Jesus would happen and everyone is resurrected, he was facing in the wrong direction. He would be facing away from Jesus. And so that's usually a sign of disrespect in the Christian tradition. So I think there's something sort of other outcasty about this particular burial. And maybe he was suspected of some kind of witchcraft. And that's why there's this sort of anti-witchcraft coin in the burial. We'll never really know for sure, um, but it's certainly a fascinating contextual example. Um, and the truth is though that coin magic is really kind of random and has lots of diverse um, things going on, especially um, in the European tradition, it became even more diverse once it spread to Africans um, in the context of slavery. And one of my favorite examples I like to share because it deals with building concealments um, comes from Ireland. And that's where folklorists in the 19th century recorded that before a wedding, a groomsman used to give the groom a sixpence and the groom would kill a magpie, slit the bird's tongue with the coin, 
leave the coin in the bird's mouth and then bury all of that with a horseshoe under the hearth. And that was what was lucky. And, and so if you ever find a building concealment that has this configuration, I wanna hear about it because that would be amazing. Um, and then the final example I wanted to share from Marilyn because it's a good segue to the next person is that in Fells Point in Baltimore, there was a, a mixed use structure kind of near the docks where one of the hearths yielded a stoneware jar that had a horseshoe in it all buried in the hearth. And we're sort of interpreting this as probably a variation on the witch bottle, which is another concealment phenomenon that's pretty well documented and that my colleagues will discuss in more detail. So I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Man, that's interesting. Uh, okay, so uh, next up, we're going to have Brenna Garrity. Um, and Brenna is an archaeologist and former curator of historic resources at Chip Oaks Plantation State Park. Um, she currently works uh, for Preservation Virginia's Bacon's Castle, leading tours and conducting research. Um, I'll also say that Brenna has her son uh, with her, so uh, that warning about we may hear children uh, very much applies to, to Brenna. <laughs> um, but Brenna, go on ahead. All right, well, please excuse my son. He is a little bit noisy right now. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about witch bottles. Now, witch bottles are um, a form of folk magic, typically European, uh, that consists of a bottle or other vessel imbued with sacred materials or meaning that's intended to counter a bewitchment. So if you think that you have been cursed by a witch, um, the witch bottle is the way that you would counter that. Now, witch bottles or similar bottle charms, um, they were sometimes used preemptively in the structure of a house to prevent black magic from entering the home in the first place. Um, so they'll often be found at points of egress, like a door, a window, a chimney. Um, they're also used to ward off or cure an illness. Um, illnesses, especially things like um, urinary tract infections, um, kidney disease, um, a lot of um, sort of the, the urinary system illnesses were often considered to be caused by a witch. Um, so in this case, the witch bottle was a way to deflect the illness back onto the witch who had caused it. Um, in English folk magic in the 17th century, witch bottles were typically Bellarmines, so like that stoneware bottle that we saw um, previously in the last slide. Um, they're a stoneware bottle typically with a masculine face on the front. Um, less common were glass vials, um, so like the great neck witch bottle that you're seeing in front of you. Um, these are more commonly associated with 18th century sites, and they tended to be buried in uh, foundations of buildings. In America, witch bottles were seemed they seem so far from what we know, and really we don't know a whole lot about witch bottles in America yet, um, but we're getting there. Um, they tend to be almost exclusively glass, so usually a wine or a medicine bottle. Um, to make the charm, uh, the afflicted individual would fill the bottle with his or her urine, uh, add some pins or nails, and or any of a wide assortment of materials. These would include hair, bones, glass, wood, matches, clay balls, thread, pages of books, or written spells. Pins or nails are most commonly what help us identify witch bottles in the archaeological record. They are believed to symbolize the pain of the individual who made the charm, um, and especially if you ever had any sort of urinary system issue, um, you can identify with that, that pin uh, feeling there. Now the afflicted person after filling their witch bottle, they would then bury it in the ground, often upside down. 
and the inversion of the bottle was believed to reverse the hex and send the illness back to the offending witch. The first witch bottle to be identified in the U.S. was found in Pennsylvania in 1976. So it's this Essington witch bottle that you're seeing right here. Um, now the Essington bottle was similar to English witch bottles of the 17th century, but it dated to 1740 to 1750. Um, and it's a glass wine bottle that was buried upside down with in a small hole with some sort of bird long bone. They think it might be a partridge. Um, and a shirt of pottery. Inside the bottle were these six round-headed pins that you see on your screen. Um, so pretty typical English style witch bottle. Um, it was placed next to the house, um, which is now known as the Governor Prince house, but at the time it was lived in by a Quaker family named the Taylors. And uh, the researchers who worked on that site believe that that is um, who probably placed that witch bottle. This discovery was the first evidence that witch bottles, this form of English folk magic, had made its way to America. By 2014, eight witch bottles had been discovered along the East Coast. Only one was known in Virginia, found at Great Neck in Virginia Beach. This witch bottle, do you mind, sir? Sir. This witch bottle dated 1690 to 1750. So tail end of the 17th into the 18th century. And it contained 25 pins and three iron nails. It was buried upside down near a doorway. Now in 2018, while I was the archaeologist for Chip Oaks Plantation State Park, which is about a mile from Bacon's Castle, um, I actually identified a witch bottle at Walnut Valley, which is a plantation that's now within the state park. Walnut Valley is home to the oldest known still standing quarter in Virginia, which dates to 1816. Now, at the time, the Walnut Valley Quarter was undergoing some extensive restoration. The floor joists had to be repaired. Um, and while the floorboards were removed, I went in to do a surface survey to recover any artifacts on the surface that could be damaged by the workmen. The workmen had also removed... <laughs> I'm sorry, he's just really howling. Um, so the workmen to do this work had removed. What is the matter? Um, did you want to take a moment and we can um, we can let uh, Rebecca talk yeah. and maybe you can come back? Yes, that would be great. Just one second. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'll uh, skip ahead a little bit and we will, we will return to the switch bottle. Um, so let's see, um, tying all this together. So we have, so, so far we have heard about footwear and we've heard about metal artifacts, um, coins and horseshoes, but also iron, a general iron, especially pointy iron artifacts. And um, we are learning about about witch bottles. Um, I will say in, in my research, there are other uh, forms of, of what I think it's Chris Manning calls bottle charms, um, which is um, uh, bottle bottles that that are concealed or that have that have been that are part of deposits, but maybe without some of the same telltale pins and nails, but with other unusual features. And then um, I also want to point to Obeya bottles, which are found in uh, African diaspora sites in the Caribbean, and bottle trees, which are, come from Africa and the African diaspora. So I want to plant those seeds um, for you here. Um, so as I mentioned before, we have this really diverse set of, of concealments. Uh, we, we will 
get back to the pretty pictures in a minute, I promise. Um, but the I wanted to put this uh, sort of schematic here where I have building deposits in the largest rectangle, um, concealments within that, and then ritual concealments within that. So um, getting in, a lot of times when you hear about building deposits, or at least when you read about them in uh, academic journals for what that's worth, you get, um, articles occasionally about rat nests and the things we can learn from rat nests. And then you get a lot of focus on specific types of ritual concealments, which are fascinating. Um, but there's all of this other stuff. And one of the really unique things I wanna point out about what about the stuff we rediscovered um, that was preserved uh, by APVA in the 70s and 80s is that they kept everything more or less. As far as we can tell, they, they made uh, documents. You'll see some of the diagrams that they drew so we know where these things came from in a minute. And, or actually, if I go back to this, um, if I can find my cursor, you can see here um, in the photo with the shoes in, on the left, the diagram. So this is how we know where these things were found. Um, and the, the context is really key, but so is the fact that they kept every, so they were interested, a lot of these folks who found this stuff were interested in architectural things. So they kept that stuff, which we aren't claiming is, is ritual, but it's still part of the house. And then they kept other things too. And so we're getting all the ambiguity and all the bits in between. So if you're familiar with archaeology and we, we look at the stratigraphy, the layers in the soil, kind of like the structural stratigraphy over time of the house. Um, but we are focusing in on these intentional concealments, which is my use of the term. I'm not saying this is what every, this is not a category everyone uses, but I've given the designation of concealment to things that I think were intentionally placed, even if I can't ascribe ritual to them. And then the ritual concealments, this definition here also comes from Chris Manning's uh, work on this. And um, these are the things like the shoes, um, and a witch bottle with pins in it that like this fits a particular practice. Sorry. Um, I'm gonna skip some of this background again. I just wanted to give you, if you need a visual, here's our map. There's Bacon's Castle on the map. This is a layout of the site as it basically as it appears um, now. Um, and then the, these are the two structures we're focused on, the, the, um, the brick house itself, and then the only extant uh, 19th century quarter so it was built to house enslaved people, but by the late, by the time of reconstruction and then in the early 20th century, it was a tenant cabin um, that uh, where it's sharecropping families live. So um, this, the brick house is again, more complicated. I won't focus too long here, but I just wanted you to see the different parts of the house. Cause I'm gonna mostly be referring to the garret, which is the upper story, the third floor. Um, but the house changed, it changed hands a lot over time and um, it, the structure of it changed. And so the, um, who lived where, when, who had access to what, when is, is an important question to ask with all of these deposits. Um, this coin here, this is the only really early sort of 17th century de deposit of any kind that we have. Um, it was found beneath a floor tile in the corner of the cellar. Um, it's dated 1675, so and it was beneath a, a tile. So it's interesting in terms of, of, you know, completion of the house or early repairs on the house. Um, it's also, uh, you know, if it, it could be a, 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 you know, dating, there are different reasons why you might place a coin that might be not quite as ritualistic as some of the things Sarah was talking about. Um, okay, so one of the, the question um, that I initially posed that these things posed for me was how do I tell, <laughs> how do I tell if what I'm looking at was intentional? How do I tell if it was ritualistic? Um, I'll, I'll, so I, this is a, this is, these are the diagrams I created as I was doing this analysis to try to decide how to talk about these different things. We're going to focus on the, again, the intentional deposits. So two and three um, up here and four and five. And you'll, what you'll notice, I hope you can see my screen, it, things are blocking it on my screen, but the, um, the photograph on the right hand side is of the west chamber the Northwest wall, the West chamber of the Garrett, you can see the little hole in what's called the knee wall. And you can tell that these intentional deposits, what's notable about them um, is that they 
they're in they're in spaces that you would access and that people would have had access to by way of those openings. Um, so again, context um, six and seven, you can those those deposits you can see in the knee wall area. Um, those are just bits of window glass, so they aren't. They don't really confirm or you know go against that theory, but I will say the only the really definitively I think um, intentional thing. So let's get to the the what they are. Um, so you can see these are deposits two and two and three um, on the upper and lower left, and then four and five. Um, my number got distorted, but four and five, and. Um, the, there were other things in with a lot of these deposits. So the shoes, this is a complete pair of shoes and um, Jessica mentioned the Northampton Museum. I was able to consult online with someone from there and we placed these shoes around uh, the made, the making of these shoes around the 1820s to 40s. Um, so like Jessica said, the early part of the 19th century, but also, as Jessica mentioned, they're incredibly worn. So they want to, they're worn through on the sole. They've been repaired with both wooden pegs and metal nails. Um, they, um, they're not a particular style. They're sort of a utilitarian shoe that could have been worn by, by anyone, but they, um, they're a work shoe. And they're the size for maybe a, a small woman or an adolescent. Um, they're, they're not very big. Um, unlike the, some pieces of leather um, and another shoe the, um, that we'll get to in a minute. So they were found with part of the dried gourd um, with a wooden spool, um, some more shoe leather. And then there were lots of nails and fragments of window glass, which may or may not actually relate to the deposit, but were found in the house. The iron nails are the really uh, kind of a, the wild card in a lot of these deposits because as Sarah was talking about and as Brenna also nodded with the pins and, and nails and which bottle, an iron nail in some cases could be an, a pointed iron you know, charm. And in, and in many, many cases, as I think in most of these deposits, an iron nail is an iron nail. So the other thing, the other thing found in the same space um, in in that Western Garrett uh, knee wall are the ones down here, deposit three. So it's um, a couple of these little purple um, hooked hooked mussel shells, which are Chesapeake a Chesapeake species. Um, I put a larger image. Those are found interestingly in various deposits throughout the house. Um, some like some like this, which look intentional and some which are less clear. Um, but that's where I think maybe we get some playfulness and you know, children collecting things, maybe that kind of thing. I'm not, I'm not sure, but they show up in several deposits. Um, this is a piece of um, woven grass mat that has surprisingly vivid colors, you can't really tell here, but paint on it. And then this, these fragments of a broken window pane that has some kind of, some kind of oxidization on them. And there are names and initials and then other non-figurative things sort of scrapped etched into them. Um, if we have time, we'll get back to that, but we can talk about it in the Q&A. But the, the broken window pane um, in with these things, in with shoes, um, I will say about this: we the name that you that I that you can see in the enlarged image of glass um, W W Rowell appears in an 1880 census. And now remember these other shoes up here at the top are from the earlier um, the earlier 19th century. And we have these are um, pre and post emancipation. Like the the time periods are different, but um, you could have somebody putting these. Deposit somebody hiding away the things from deposit three could reasonably have also seen the things from deposit two in the same space. And so you could have these areas that people can access over time, different residents of the house, and they're kind of interacting with each other and interacting with the house this way by hiding things away. So deposits four and five um, are interesting. We have deposit four has a partially mummified complete rodent skeleton that was posed, curled up in this really large oyster shell. Um, and it's with some other animal remains, faunal remains. So the, this bone is part of a bird, an avian bone. This little guy has caused some, some debate and I have not been certain if I'm correct. So I, looking at it initially, thought it was a very tiny, um, 
like turtle remains, tortoise remains. And then um, Brenna and Brenna and I talked about this and then I, you know, looked, I looked at it again. I, now I'm really unsure, but we sent it to a zoo archeologist so, um, and he thinks it is turtle remains. So I don't know what this is, but it is faunal remains of some kind. Um, and I welcome, I welcome input on this. But in, in any case, these were found together along with fragments of this blue, these blue and white ceramics, um, transfer print ceramics, one of which looks like dendritic, uh, if, it, if this is the sort of thing that matters to you. Um, if you're a historical archaeologist, it looks like a dendritic uh, motif, but it's actually transfer prints. So it's a little odd. Um, and then some, a couple more nails and slate fragments, a piece of paper with a bit of what looks like silk fibers like you'd get from a ribbon bookmark attached to it, and some architectural things and a wooden bead. So it's a little bit of an odd mix, but I don't think the mummified rat and the oyster shell and the blue and white ceramics and faunal remains together is, is a coincidence, um, especially because it's in the same area as deposit five. Now deposit five has these bottle fragments. They're, they make up almost three complete bottles, not quite. Um, and there was another bottle uh, fragment found elsewhere under the floor in the garret. And then this shoe. So this is the most, in my opinion, the most, um, the clearest evidence of sort of a ritual concealment like we've seen in other places. Um, Jessica talked about shoes. I don't think she mentioned cut shoes. That the phenomenon that I have read is, is seen somewhat with some frequency. Um, so this is a large, um, probably man's shoe, it's much larger than the pair, than the ones in the pair of shoes. And it's been cleanly sort of cut down the middle. And so we just have the heel portion. Um, I think it's probably from around the same time. Um, it's hard to tell with only half of it, but it's made in similar sort of way. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so we have, and the other things are hiding, I cannot, I cannot see under, there we go. Um, okay, so we have some more blue and white ceramics, of course, and then fragments of a couple of pieces of paper. One is plain and one is from a, um, a periodical. There were other um, paper fragments in the, in the collection as well. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's go back to the, the map. Now I've put these, I've mapped these things onto our, our floor plan here. Um, and you can, this is the floor plan that was included with the artifacts and then um, that we found. And then these are the reminding us where each of these things are. So they're hidden carefully in a space that is accessible, open over time. So it wasn't just there was an episode of remodeling and, and the things were put in and then sealed up. They were kind of constantly, um, you know, in spaces that were constantly open. Um, I put this quote here from a report by Peyton Young for Preservation Virginia. Um, Peyton has, has done incredible research and interviewed members of the African-American community in Surrey, the Surrey County African-American Historical Society and, and other folks who are descended from people who were both enslaved and, and free residents of the Bacon's Castle property and area. Um, and one of the accounts was a, a, of a, a woman passed down to her descendants when she was a child, she was made to sleep in what she called the, the hole in the wall in the garret. And so I, this is not here to say that these are her shoes or that these are her, this is from her, but it's pointing to the sort of intimacy of these spaces for so many people and the kinds of things you might, you could kind of think people might do to make these spaces their own um, and to also keep their own belongings and keep their own, you know, um, special things safe. Um, I know I'm going over time because that's just how I roll. So I'm going to try to speed it along. Um, to move to the quarter, um, and we can always come back to these images in the Q&A. Um, again, so in the quarter, there have been other things found. I don't have them all here. Some of them were found in the fire, one of the fireplaces. Um, but they were a little bit more like bits and pieces of things. But here up, up at the top, we have a knife, a, the knife, a blade and the tang, it's missing its handle. Um, and then some nails, a key, 
and some fragments of white clay tobacco pipes. And these were found behind a, Carol can correct me if I'm wrong, behind a, a loose brick in one of the, the fireplaces. Um, and so it's somebody, you know, there's a loose brick, someone takes it out, they put these things in and they put the brick back. This is not, um, you know, a rat's nest or things falling through a hole in the floor. Um, you know, a key could be a practical thing to hide. Um, you know, this is one case where I think the nails probably are symbolic in some way because they they aren't just being pulled out of a out of a void in a wooden wall. They're in here behind the brick. Um, white clay pipe stems um, are something I have I've read about um, in subfloor pit deposits. So this this um, quarter is has a raised floor and it's later than we see subfloor pits. I'm gonna try to touch on those at the end, but I don't know if I'm gonna have time. And I know there are better experts than me on this, <laughs> in the participants on this. Um, but I, I've noted, what I wanted to point out here first is the fact that we have these iron implements. We have two different knives concealed in places in the quarter. Um, and I think that some of the finds we are getting in the walls and in both the quarter and in the Garrett area, um, some of them are more similar to things I've seen in, in, in read about, I will hasten to add, in subfloor pit deposits. And so if um, you know, people may be following some similar kinds of traditional patterns of things that, you know, significant things, blue and white ceramics or things related to water, shells, white pipe stems, iron implements. But you know, this is a later time and they're concealing them in different ways. They have access to different spaces that they're using. So um, this is uh, another, the bottom set of artifacts on the left here are the ones that came from the quarter, but I put this there in a case at Bacon's Castle with artifacts that were found in the main house um, in the Hankins, the 19th century Hankins dining room fireplace. And there's a silver knife in there um, as well as a some nails and a, um, a, ra a straight razor blade. And so I just wanted to point out the, the three different knives. That's one, that along with the shells, these are these are just little patterns that appear, but I think sometimes we might interpret differently in different places um, in the house. So I'm okay, moving along. So this is where I, I, um, I won't go deep into this, but this is, these, this is what I was talking about for those who are not familiar. And I realized that the people who actually wrote about these are probably maybe on this call and so I don't want to embarrass myself. But these um, these are examples from both Dax uh, and Patricia Samford's book about uh, subfloor pits. And um, I, I want to point out on the one hand, the parallels and specific types of items that I think we see here, but also to say that I'm not saying they're the same thing or the same phenomenon, but I think for archeologists, um, there are things we could learn for not, not looking at the types of things we find in building deposits, but looking at the fact that, you know, the, these are cases where you find things that have accidentally fallen, been, you know, put in the subfloor pits later, things that were intentionally placed, some things that are, have spiritual meaning, some things that were very practically stored. Um, so I think um, there's a lot there to, to think about. And I, um, the, this is the last, my last point here. So um, I think that the really important part about, again, about looking at all of these deposits together is just what it can show um, that we might not otherwise see that we wouldn't have access to in the ground or um, otherwise about live, people living and working in these spaces and particularly about um, both enslaved and, um, you know, uh, the non-elite residents, the not the owners of the houses, who were the primary tenants um, for a lot of the history of the site, and um, especially in the time period we're talking about here. Um, so this is this, these quotes here um, from Whitney Battle Baptiste's book um, that I think speak to that. Um, so I I suspect I'm way over time, so I'm going to stop for now. Um, but we can come back. Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to ask, uh, Brenna, did you want to say a few more words about the witch bottles? You're, you're on mute still. 
Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so just kind of talking about um, the same sort of ritual concealment that um, we're seeing at these sites in England, um, that is what we ended up finding at Walnut Valley. So the Walnut Valley Quarter dates to 1816. Um, the floor had been pulled up to repair the joists. Um, and I went in to do a surface survey and recover any artifacts that might be damaged during um, the workman's time there. And they had also removed a section of bricks from the hearth that were badly deteriorated. Um, and underneath those bricks, there was a hole. And in the hole was a bottle. So it's a dark green glass um, wine or cider bottle. Um, and it dates from any time between 1810 to 1870. It's been harder to narrow it down further than that. Um, so it may have been placed during the construction of the house in 1816, or it might have been put in later. Uh, the bottle contained about five pins. Some were broken, so it's a little hard to say 100%. Um, and then also it contained a mouse bone, some shell fragments, charcoal, and a scrap of newspaper. Um, this one was unusual. It follows a lot of the same... Uh, patterns that we see with witch bottles in England and also throughout the U.S., but it also has, um, it was buried right side up, which is very unusual for a witch bottle. Um, when it was recovered, as you can see, the top is broken, so we don't know if it was stoppered at one point or not, um, but it looks like when the bricks were placed over the hole, um, they might've been put on kind of hard and broken the top of that bottle. Um, so we don't know if it, if it did contain a stopper, which would indicate the presence of urine in the bottle. Um, we, it's just one of those things we're just not sure about. Um, now the bottle also is interesting because it was found in an enslaved African context. So this is a traditional English sort of bottle charm um, found in an African-American context, which is particularly interesting because it highlights this cultural exchange that was going on um, between not just um, English and enslaved African communities, um, but also involving uh, Virginia Indian communities as well. Um, so this, this sharing of ritual um, is really kind of highlighted by the Walnut Valley quarter bottle. Okay, well, there we go. I'm glad I was able to get that out this time. <laughs> yeah. And, and thank you, everybody. Um, your presentations are, are absolutely fascinating. Um, so we've got a couple of questions from the audience, and one of them um, is, is one that, uh, that I had too, which is, um, could anybody clarify a little bit more um, how, how you are able to uh, date um, a lot of uh, these objects? I mean, obviously, if there's a coin, there's, there's a date, but um, can you talk a little bit about how, how you know when these are considered ritual concealments versus, you know, something else? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the, in terms of dating with the Bacon's Castle artifacts, there were a few different things. Um, I, some of these things like shoes, for example, um, and we had a lot of paper artifacts actually, um, are not things that survive in the ground archaeologically. So I don't have as, you know, it's not as easy for me as an archaeologist to, um, to date them as if it's bottles or ceramics. So we, we call experts. <laughs> um, I emailed um, Rebecca Shawcross, who is at the Northampton Museum, which is, Jessica mentioned, um, with uh, images of the shoes, for example. And um, it has, it in that case, has to do with the, particularly the way the shoes are made. So if they had, um, you know, wooden pegs or metal nails. Um, the other thing, of course, the tricky thing with the shoes is that they might not be, they might be concealed considerably after the time when they were made because they're worn out. Um, the paper, there's some interesting ways of dating 
paper. Um, if it's printed, you can look at the typeface, um, particularly the S's, you know, the long S versus the short S. Um, the ceramics, I can tell you, there's the types of ceramics, the transfer printed um, pearlware ceramics that we saw, those have, those have um, you know, a range of dates in which they exist. But again, how long did people own, own and use these things before they were broken and deposited is another question. Um, the bottles are interesting because the way they're made, um, they're, they could be early, they could be more like 18th century, um, later 18th century, but they could be 18th century bottles, um, but they could also be 19th century bottles because of, you know, that not everybody switched to, you know, machine finished bottles all at once. So, um, but there are basically, we're looking at the dates of the artifacts. And then I was also looking at, and then, then I was sort of looking at, okay, who lived in the house at this time? Um, what spaces existed in what ways at, at this time? Um, so that's um, for the dating part, that's, that's where I would start. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, this is another question that uh, that we have is, um, so it, you continue to mention, you know, these practices come from a European tradition, but it seems like they've, they've morphed here. Did anybody want to talk a little bit more about like the origins of a lot of these traditions? I can talk a little bit about the, the witch bottles. Um, so the earliest mention of witch bottles is in 17th century England, which I think is particularly interesting because that is such a heavy period of colonization in England. So it's possible that these traditions could have been um, potentially even being carried from elsewhere, but they're also documented outside of England, um, in Germany, Holland, um, across Scandinavia. They're... Um, a pretty, pretty endemic European phenomena. Um, now, when they come to uh, the new world, of course, they're gonna be a little bit different. People are using what they have on hand, um, like the Bellarmine bottles. Um, there might be some connection between um, sort of the male depiction on the Bellarmine bottles and being used as um, sort of a stand-in for like a, a warlock watching over the charm. Um, but when the colonists come to America, they are starting to um, use different kinds of bottles. So that's why in our Virginia context, we typically see glass bottles. And that seems to be true up and down the East Coast. Um, so people are um, not necessarily married to the... Um, the tradition perfectly. Um, so there's lots of room for, for change as these, these traditions come um, to the new world and start to intermarry with other cultures and morph a little bit. Excellent. Anybody else wanna speak on that? I can add about the coins if you want. <clears throat> the, a lot of the coin magic, like I said in my talk dates all the way back in the Western world, at least to ancient Greece, um, and it's very common in Europe and, and the British Isles. <clears throat> but pretty much as soon as you get um, slavery in the US and well, in the colonies um, happening and people are interacting, um, the coin magic very quickly spreads into the African-American community over here. Um, and there's some interesting resources um, that, that I've seen that talk about um, how, uh, this is from, an article on coin magic by um, Jim Davidson. Anyway, he talks about how uh, there was a belief amongst African-Americans that African style conjuring didn't work against white people. And so if you were, and you know, by that logic, if you wanted to conjure against white people, then you might want to very quickly adopt the kind of conjuring and magic and superstitions that white people use. So you could then use it against them. And, and all of these sort of protective um, things and conjuring things are, they're sort of an armor against helplessness. You know, they're a way to turn an everyday item into a, a combat against a feeling of helplessness for any reason. You're trying to influence something. 
And so it makes a lot of sense that you get a lot of this adoption of, of these beliefs among both people for whatever reasons, you get a lot of blending going on. And so the coins very quickly spread and you find them throughout the, the colonial, the post-contact period in, in our area in both the colonial European context and the African-American context. So it's really hard to figure out which is which depending on the content. You always have to look at the context at that particular site to really figure out where, who's probably doing it. And you may never be able to figure it out. Yeah, and, and, and as I mentioned, I think the, the bottles and the iron implements in particular, at least, again, based on, based on my reading, but in, there are things like that that do seem to have some certain or, like origins that could come from many different parts of the world, including some, from, some, some practices that already existed in, in Africa and some practices that already existed in Britain and Europe. Um, and then you see if you are living somewhere and you see, you know, everybody's using some kind of bot, it might be different, but everyone is using, maybe everyone kind of seems to be using bottles or, um, you know, metal thing, you know, you might, you can kind of see, and this is, you know, projecting from this, but this is, you can see how people might note that well these this type this type of thing broadly seems to be particularly powerful because everyone tends to to use some version of it and so um i i think yeah i think um the context and the the processes and understanding like the history the specific history of a given site is really the key rather than saying is this thing you know from this you know this this identity versus this identity i think it's it's really important to look at. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I can mention briefly about, about shoes, just about the origin of using mm -hmm. shoes in this way. Um, I, I sort of touched on um, folklore and um, re when I was researching folklore related to shoes and, and again, sort of originated um, in Europe um, as my understanding based on my research. And um, a lot of it, as I was saying, has to do with old shoes. And a lot of the concealed shoes are old and worn out. And um, one um, theory is that an old shoe was able to sort of like take on the form of a human being. Um, and for that reason, it could have been more effective um, in terms of white magic. Um, that there's a shoe historian, June Swan, who was at the Northampton Museum, not to keep harping on the Northampton Museum, but it's the place to go for, for shoes. Uh, she described it as shoes um, being able to retain the essence of the wearer. So, um, and because of that, they were sometimes used um, as, well, it's um, hypothesized that they were sometimes used as decoys um, in doorways and hearths and things like that. And so it's, I think it sort of parallels the human um, elements of a witch battle, you know, things like nail pairings and things like that, that you're, you have this sort of human element. Um, just wanted I to- also, yeah. Oh, sorry. I, no. I also think it's the thing about shoe, that aspect of shoes, that ability to sort of retain the shape the essence of the wear. Um, a lot of this, I think speaks to the other, the other aspect of a lot, I think a lot of these deposits at Bacon's Castle, which is maybe they're more about remembrance or more about thinking, you know, um, and the, the, what you, what Jessica mentioned about baby shoes being, a you know, you've seen, I've, I've seen at least my father's bronze baby shoes in my grandmother's house when I was a kid, but like the baby shoes on a, on an infant grave. Um, I think that, Sometimes these things may be rather more than they are even necessarily um, magical in the way that we're we've been focusing on. They might also be sort of mnemonic and like sort of affective, like emotional um, uh, caches, like sentimental, like sort of an off an ofrenda, like a like a little personal altar. So that's another way I thought about some of these things too. But the horseshoes sort of, they mimic the, the human shoes <clears throat> in the sense that they have to be, in order for them to be effective, they can't just be like brand new and obtained to like protect your house. They're supposed to be found um, and, and have wear. And so if, and if they have nails and those pointy sharp nails, they're even more protective. 
And, you know, there's, there's no really good answer as to like why, um, but one of the actual firsthand accounts that I've read that was really great from the 19th century in Baltimore, um, it was an African-American woman said that, that the horseshoe over the door is protective against witchcraft because if the witch tries to come in at night, if she encounters that horseshoe, she has to travel all of the roads that that horse traveled wearing that shoe before she can come back and get through into the house. And by that time it would be morning and it would be safe again. And so there was like a mechanical aspect to it that, that the physical like walking in the shoe somehow was postponing the influence of the evil. And it made me wonder if that could apply to any of the human shoes too. Um, which I have no idea. That's the only account of that interpretation I've ever seen. So there's so many different explanations for all of these things um, that the why is like, this all fascinating and there's usually a reason, but we can't really tell you what it is. <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. Um, okay, so a couple of questions um, about um, which bottles is there any correlation to the number of pins or nails that are found in a witch bottle for any specific meaning? Yeah, so the um, the Essington bottle had, that was the one in Pennsylvania, um, that one had six pins in it, and six is um, associated with witchcraft. It's a number that in English folklore is associated with witchcraft. Um, that's where we get the word hex from, um, six hex. Um, so it's, it's theorized that six could be a common number for pins or nails in a witch bottle um, for that reason. Now that doesn't explain the, the great neck bottle, which had 25 pins and three nails in it. Uh, maybe that's just overkill. Maybe someone was showing that they're very uncomfortable. Um, but the the numbers do seem to typically correlate to um, a witchcraft related number. So the Walnut Valley bottle had about five, um, but some of those pins were broken. And because the bottle wasn't perfectly intact when I discovered it, it, it means that some of their might could might have been some sort of deterioration maybe the, the sixth pin broke down or something like that um, and because some of them were fragmentary um, there's also a ton of sediment and silt inside the bottle as well um, there could have been six pins in it initially um, but either way I mean five is also a number that's associated with witchcraft um, the pentagram so it's possible that that could have been um, related. I'd also like to look more into um, numerical symbolism in West African tradition, um, because that that could certainly give some clues as to why that number um, and why some of the other inclusions as well. Um, along those same lines, uh, there was a question about uh, the bottle being upright or, um, or turned mm -hmm. over. Um, any ideas of why that tradition came about? Yeah, so the inversion of the bottle is supposed to um, reverse the curse. So it's uh, basically inverting the hex um, to send it back to the witch who caused it. Um, in our case, the bottle is right side up, which is really unusual. Um, I don't, I don't want to throw out a statistic <laughs> of the number of which bottles that are typically found inverted, but it does seem to be a pretty typical um, way to find a witch bottle is inverted. And in our case, it was right side up, um, which makes me think maybe it's more of a protective charm. Um, it also seems meaningful that it was buried at a point of egress. So in this case, the chimney. Um, so that tends to uh, make me think that it's more along the lines of those English witch bottles that are buried as a protective spell rather than a um, reversal of an illness. So not 100% not sure what that means um, for our bottle at Walnut Valley, but um, it's, it's certainly unusual being right side up. 
Okay. Um, so can I, can I jump in? Oh, absolutely, Jessica. I'm sorry. I keep putting you No, off. that's okay. I was just going to say, I, I wonder if sometimes some of the specifics, especially over time, as these things kind of evolved, I wonder if some of the specifics were sort of um, lost, you know, so maybe someone thought we need to, you know, we need to put something sharp in it or some nails, but maybe they, maybe the number had been lost and mm -hmm. we need to vary it that maybe the inversion had gotten lost. Um, I think about that, especially with sort of 19th century examples, as opposed to 17th or 18th century, just, um, just a thought I thought I'd throw out there. Yeah. The number of pins and nails and things like that, it varies so much. And when you think about it, it's, it's really hard to study this stuff because it's hard to find documented, like, like what you were saying, like, I wish I could find the diary entry that says, and I put my shoe in the corner and this is why, but both for, for religious reasons early on. And then later, because the enlightenment sort of put a stigma on superstition, a lot of this stuff just isn't written down. People don't really talk about it. And so it morphs and changes and it gets passed on from one person to the other and then people change it as they go. And so like the horseshoe acquires more and more and more meaning. And nowadays it's like, it's a lucky charm. Like it's, it's in a, it's a marshmallow in a cereal, you know? And it, I mean, that, that kind of thing, like going way back is, is completely different, but you can see how it all morphs over time and it's not prescriptive like that. So there might very well be a significance to the number. Maybe you have 25 pins because the person you think cursed you is 25 years old. I and mean, we have no idea. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I think that there's a lot of human agency involved here and, and things get changed, um, with each iteration and each generation. Uh, that, what kind of modern comparisons do we have to, you know, these things like, uh, the shoes and the wall and coin, lucky coins and, um, those kinds of things. Did you ever say find a penny, pick it up, and all day long you have good luck? <laughs> You've done coin magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we were we when we were meeting before this to talk about what we were going to talk about, we discussed you know things that we all collect or that that you know we've seen children you know collect and keep, um, and sometimes it it is sometimes it's it feels more trivial and sometimes the stuff feels very meaningful, but you'd be hard pressed to explain to somebody else why you kept the thing you kept or why it's on your shelf. Um, and I think I, I, I say that not to trivialize what we found or just like remove any of the, yeah, someone mentioned knock on wood in the chat. So not to trivialize any of it or to remove the magic from it, but to say that like the reason it's magic is because of the connections that it, that like, emotional or mnemonic, I keep using that word, but like memory related connections that it makes to, to something um, or that, you know, you, you know that this thing, this is a tradition that exists and it's meaningful to you, but maybe what you have on hand is different than what the tradition says or what you, the thing you find meaningful looks a little bit different than, you know, the the traditional practice or something like that. So I do, I think that this sort of stuff is powerful and meaningful because it's something that we all like more or less engage in in some, in some way. Um, I mentioned the bronze baby shoes. I mean, I think that might be the clo closest in terms of some kind of connection to actual shoes. But I think also people read about this stuff or learn, know about it. Maybe they know about it from their own family history, but. I think people, there's some, there is some sort of new age or sort of new recycling of this. I have some friends who are flipping a house here in Williamsburg um, who've found modern things um, in a, a box in the wall. Um, and I know some folks who found a mummified cat, which is something we didn't get into except for the mummified rodent, but like um, the, and these are not super old examples. They're, they're somewhat more recent. So I, I, I think, yeah. I've read some articles too that talk about very recent finds of, of shoes, you know, like five years ago, where um, people were people were nervous to remove them. So they would put them back in the walls and sort of this sense of maybe not knowing, you know, quite why, but that it would be bad luck, you know, to, to remove them. So it's still there, you know, and some sense of the uh, 
in some form. And as far as witch bottles go, you can buy witch bottles on Etsy. You can um, still find all kinds of um, recipes for them and stuff online. So they're, they're still something that's um, like Rebecca mentioned a little bit of this um, maybe sort of new age uh, thought or paganism, neo-paganism. Um, it's still, it's still definitely a, a part of our, of our society. All right, so we're, we're getting to the, towards the end of our questions, but there was one question um, that, that I think is definitely worth talking about um, from our places um, as historians and researchers and, and curators um, of, of these objects in our collections. Um, and it's what's being done to incorporate modern day practitioners of these traditions so that the still active spiritual tools are treated with appropriate care. So, I mean, you know, we have these objects that were buried or found in the walls. Um, what what are, are we doing as practitioners to make sure that they are um, they are treated with the care and respect that they that they deserve? Um. So I I think that part of it is you know caring caring. I, I, this may not quite answer the question uh, that was intended, but um, I, I think. For me, as an archaeologist, it's it's about caring for the collections that we have. So, like we have all of these things are from people's lives and people's homes in the past. And sometimes we end up with things from from burials. Sometimes we end up with with burials. Um, all of these, you know, uh, inter interacting with with the communities um, that are connected to them is is important, like vitally important work. Um, sharing what we found, which is what, why we do why we're doing this, um, and making sure that the 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 artifacts in the collections that we have are being conserved and packed and stored and cared for, so that they're going to last um, and they're going to be you know and fi finding ways to make them accessible when we can, but finding ways to keep them to also keep them from deteriorating um, in storage. Um, I you know, in this case, and if I am incorrect in this, I, I'm open to suggestions. I, I think in this case, I didn't, I didn't come across things that appear, I've talked to, I have spoken with, um, I've not spoken with as many descendants or community members as I would like. I have spoken with um, the, the quote I mentioned earlier, I've spoken with a, the, a gentleman who's a descendant of Cordelia Jones, who was the, the woman who lived at Bacon's Castle. Um, but I, have, I haven't spoken with people so far who've told me that they have personal connections to the, the like concealed aspect, like the spiritual, like that wasn't a concern of his, and that doesn't mean it wouldn't be somebody else's. Um, I, I think these practices are so broadly practice the things we found are not things that make me think we need to seek uh i don't know okay. maybe that's <laughs> wrong but um i think that the community uh is you know it is important i i don't i don't have a good answer beyond that i guess so so i would like to compare these to the processes that preservation virginia is currently doing with our with, with through nagra um, and, and that is to make sure that people who could be connected with them have the opportunity to, uh, to be part of the conversations to determine what the next steps moving forward with them are. Um, and so when we're working with uh, Virginia Indian communities and other communities where um, there are indigenous artifacts, objects, um, we're, we're saying, you know, we're saying, do you, do you want these in a lot of cases? You know, should we repatriate? Do you want them to be repatriated? Do you want them to, you know, how, how do we display them? And it's just been very extraordinarily important for us to um, have these conversations um, to make sure that the context and the people who, uh, who are associated with them, are their, their voices are not only recognized, but they're part of the co-curation of these objects. Um, and I think Rebecca, in, in your particular example, while we knew this box was 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 in storage, it hadn't been touched for thirty years. 
And so it's really thanks to you and, and your program and, and the work study students that you've brought in to assist that we've been able to actually identify what these objects are. Um, but it's only a first step. But I, I would like to pose that to Jessica and Sarah um, if you have any thoughts for your organizations. Um, oh, sorry, Sarah, I'll just real quick. Um, well, one thing I think is really important, like you were saying, Rebecca, is getting the word out, you know, about these types of objects, um, because context is everything, you know, and if you come across something like this in a box, just saying found in the wall and, you know, 2000, um, there's only so much you can do with it. So I, I think getting the word out and having people understand how important these, these are, you know, having things photographed before they're removed, um, just preserving context, I think is, is key. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, you know, the first step before you can figure out even who you would need to consult is recognizing that there's a thing happening there. And, and we're often not doing that. And like uh, one of the examples I showed had the horseshoes distributed around the building. Every single one of those horseshoes was cataloged as a stable artifact. They weren't excavating a stable, you know? And, and that's because of how we categorize things in archeology. span and, 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 and it's, it's a function sort of our job. So we need to get people to recognize these things first um, to open their minds up enough to, to think that shoe's not just a shoe. And then you move on from there. But I will say for, for, I work at a repository for collections. And so all of the examples that I showed are, are collections that have already been excavated. The excavations are done. That means that, and, and the vast majority of those buildings don't stand anymore. Cloverfields is still standing, but most of them don't. So, so the, protect, the building that those things were trying to protect, that building doesn't exist anymore. So I don't know if those would be considered active um, protections or not, if the building isn't there. I don't know, because I don't actually really know the intent of the person putting it there. The best I can do is try to recognize it. Um, and then upon recognizing it, figure out if it still has any relevance, if there's anything still there. Um, and then, yeah, it would be great to get the word out so that people might contact us and say, hey, you know, maybe you should put those shoes back in that cellar just in case, just as Jessica was saying, you know, where people are sort of like, maybe I should leave that alone. Um, but yeah, recognition and, and, and knowing the context of these everyday items so that we can get that recognition out there is, is paramount. All right, so um, so I think that we now we're we're over a, about a half hour over our time. <laughs> I I knew that this would would happen, and I knew that the discussion that we would have at the end of this would be absolutely amazing. So for those of you who have stuck with us, thank you so much. Um, and uh, it, it was asked a couple of times, but I'll just make sure that everybody knows um, this webinar has been recorded, and um, it give us about a week or so and it'll be up on the uh up on the website um and um we'll make sure that all of the attendees get a link to it and feel free to share it uh as as much as you would like um so with that i'd like to thank uh jessica and sarah and brenna and rebecca so much for joining us today um you really brought uh, a, a lot of knowledge to the table and we super appreciate it so thank you so much, everybody. And um, I hope to see you at future webinars and maybe in person. All right. Thank you. Thank you for putting Thanks this for together. having us. Thanks.